Good day. This is Women's Leadership Success. Dot com. I'm thrilled today to have Faisal Hoke with me. Faisal is, um, I have to read this because there's so much. Um, he was voted top 100 most influential people in technology. He's a regular contributor to Fast Company and the Harvard Review. Faisal is an accomplished entrepreneur, noted thought leader, technology innovator, advisor to CEOs, and the federal government, and a best-selling author. His book, Everything Connects, will be re-released this year by Fast Company. I had the great pleasure of interviewing Faisal on this book, July 2014. It was one of my all-time favorite books and interviews. It's uh, WLS number 59. I recommend that you listen to it again. It's called Everything Connects, A Woman's Career Guide to Personal Success. His newest Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Lift, Fostering the Leader in You Amid Revolutionary Global Change, explores the intersection of transformational leadership, systemic thinking, and experiential learning, all required to survive and thrive. This tsunami of changes and disruption is caused by several things, which I'll ask Faisal about in a minute. So Faisal, I'm so thrilled to have you here today. And I was going to start with a question, but you mentioned that you almost didn't write the book. And I would really like for you to share what you said about that. Thank you. The, thanks for that very warm and generous introduction. Uh, so one of the, one correction, I do not write for Harvard Business Review. Oh. I do write, write for uh, Business Insider, uh, nevertheless. So the, re, the, the, you know, I mean, we all gone through all sorts of changes. Uh, you know, uh, some of the changes are together as a society because of pandemic and, and other things. Uh, you know, personally, each one of us have, I'm sure, have gone through tremendous amount of changes professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. In my case, um, you know, I mean, um, um, right before, uh, right, right at the beginning of pandemic, my teenage son goes to, you know, started his freshman year. And then uh, his, you know, he comes home because of pandemic. Turns out he has uh, a rare um, blood cancer. Fortunately, there are treatment available and he's doing fine. And, uh, but uh, right at that beginning of that uh, situation, which was almost now 15 months ago, um, I, I, um, I, I, I signed the contract to do the book, but I, I, right after I found out, it took out the air out of me and, and I almost didn't do the book, uh, but I ended up doing it partly because I thought this was a very important message. It's an optimistic message that is very much needed given all the things that are going on in the world. And the fact is that I kind of wrote it, uh, his generation, uh, as, a, as, a, as in my mind, because they're just coming off age, right? So they're, they're kind of lived through this. Like my son didn't have his graduation because of pandemic. Then he goes to college campus, comes home. Uh, we're seeing massive uh, geopolitical changes, we're seeing climate changes, crazy um, misinformation driving both sides of the political realm. So a lot of these changes, and I kind of wrote it uh, uh, him as a you know as a, one of the audience, and what us as adults should be doing uh, to to help that uh, you know that generation. But I also um, you know wanted to um, take the proceed of the book, and I, I wasn't. You know, it was not anticipated that <laughs> it will do so well and became a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller. Uh, so that happened and I, I kind of, I, you know, I've, we created a whole bunch of training and educational program around it and I've kind of uh, pledged all this uh, for cancer research. Um, so all the proceeds from the book and, and my uh, training courses goes to cancer research. Thank you for doing that. That is a, such a wonderful thing you're doing for all of us. Because there's nobody, no one on the planet that isn't touched by cancer, as well as the pandemic. It's it's such a 
serious problem. So I, I think it really is important for young people to understand this. And <clears throat> your book goes into such depth on all of the different challenges we're facing right now. And it connects to how important it is for us to be transformational leaders. So could you just say a little more about the uh, disruptions? And I also would love you to give a definition of that word. I remember a long time ago, I studied Gurdjieff, and Gurdjieff said, in life, you go down a path, and then something happens, you hit a shock point, and you can't keep on that path. You've got to go on a different path. Yeah. And is that what you mean by disruption? What yeah, I mean, it's, disruption? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's divergent, right? So, I mean, in the sense that you, you, you're on a path and it totally knocks you off your path and you, you have to rethink and reinvent and redo whatever that you have been doing. And it happens on individual level. It happens on a societal level. I mean, so, so it happens in, you know, in organization, uh, disruption is like par for, of, par for living, I guess, right? So, so, so the way I, so, you know, and, and you know that I love connecting um, kind of disjointed uh, things together, uh, like I did in Everything Connects, you know, uh, looking at mindfulness and creativity and innovation. So mm -hmm. on, on um, Lyft was driven by, the, uh, the, you know, these, these separate change of events, but somehow they connect and they have tremendous impact as a whole. So, and I, I kind of looked at it from a, you know, these four major change point of view. So one is obviously pandemic. We all lived through it, living through it, um, you know, and it's, it's completely changed the way we work, socialize, learn, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. But along the way, in the, same, in the same time, you know, what we have also seen, I mean, you and I are doing this Zoom call. I mean, the technological advancement that has kind of rapidly, um, um, you know, accelerated during that time out of necessity, right? So whether that's on communication, whether that's uh, medical field, I mean, you know, I, and I lived through this uh, personally because of my son, but also because of, you know, we, I have a, a aging mother who is in nursing home, so we have to do a lot of telehealth type of a thing. Um, you know, so so um, um, so technological, you know, and, and then the business models, you know, all driven by massive technological changes, and you know, we kind of call that fourth industrial revolution because that technological advancement it's actually convergence of a lot of different type of technology. It's uh, you know information technology, uh, manufacturing technology, uh, nanotechnology, biomedical technology, it's all coming in one place to change the way, uh, you know, we live, period, mm -hmm. not just work. Or, so that's another thing. Um, obviously, we've lived through misinformation. Uh, you know, does pandemic exist? Doesn't it exist? Is it man-made? Is it, you know, we've seen all kind of gamut of, misinformation and it's driven by vested or or ill will parties it doesn't matter which side of the belief system you're in whether you're left or right it doesn't matter uh, disinformation and misinformation completely changed the social makeup and and it created a humongous amount of distrust and 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 uh, you know um, almost that 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 uh, civility we had is gone right so so we don't want to almost want to learn what the facts are right so so that's that and the last thing which we are you know i mean we're middle of summer you know i mean flights are not going in paris public transportation cannot go in london mm -hmm. um, i was in germany last week um, you know it was nice but this week is horrendous you know i mean it's like t climate has completely changed right crops are dying um, you know, we have water crisis. Uh, some cases in my native land, Bangladesh, it had massive flood a couple of months ago. This is crazy things, right? So it's, it's creating this massive uh, migration because people can live where they used to live. 
So all of, so if you look at those four things, that's kind of how I looked at massive change, and they're all kind of interconnected. Mm-hmm. Um, that's drove you know the the background. These are the major changes, and those are major disruption. So now, what are you gonna do? Are you, can you do the things the way you were doing? No, you can't. I mean, it just, you can't do. It cannot be the same old, same old. Whether you are a government leader, whether you're my son's age, uh, whether you're an entrepreneur, uh, whether you're an author, whatever it is, it's, you can't do the same thing. Faisal, how, how, do you think people know that or notice it? <clears throat> and if, if, how would I know that this isn't going to work anymore? I need to do something totally different. Is there, what are my clues? I'm, in the book, you talk about getting three questions to get unstuck. Are those good things to ask? Yeah, you, you can ask, uh, you know, like, what is it not working? What I sh- you know, w- w- what is it that I should be doing differently? Why am I doing? I mean, there's a lot of question about why, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I mean, we, we go on, gone through this really uh, uh, in many ways, kind of like a for good or bad sort of a spiritual, uh, cha- you know, uh, questionnaire about why am I doing what am I doing? Why do I have to go to work? Uh, you know, why do I have to work seven days? Uh, why can't I see my parents? Uh, you know, so what? We got pandemic. I mean, these are a lot of whys, right? So uh, why am I not sending my child to school? Uh, they're getting socially disjointed. It's having psychological impact. A lot of whys, right? So, so my point is that um, if, if by now, uh, if you haven't uh, felt that something has completely changed, that maybe you are living under a rock because the world has changed. I mean, it's, there's, it, you know, I mean, uh, we always talk about change, but the change, uh, you don't, you know, the kind of change we have gone through last few years, it, it, we've seen that change society as a whole, not just as an individual. So, I mean, we're feeling the heat, we're feeling the cold, we're feeling the, the, the you know, the, um, uh, flooding. I mean, these are changes that very, uh, uh, very vivid. Uh, you cannot feel this change. So, if that's the case, um, you know, you have to do things differently. I mean, I mean, I know, like, I mean, I'm sure in your neighborhood, uh, um, many restaurants has closed, but then many also s- thrived during pandemic, right? Because mm-hmm. some thrived because they repackaged their food and they were very adapt to delivery models that just cropped up and some just died because people were not going and visiting physically in the restaurant and they didn't reinvent, right? So those are very simple examples of why you need to change. Uh, It could be economic driver, it could be psychological driver, whatever. So how do you do do that? Before we started, you said this is an optimistic book. So how how do we, what kind of actions can we take that are going to help us to be a transformational leader and also impact the bigger picture. Sure, but first let me tell you why it's optimistic. Uh, So out of disruption, there's always tons of opportunities. So let's just take that example of restaurant that I gave you, right? So (laughs) there are restaurants that kind of thrived middle of pandemic and they couldn't keep up with the business because there was such high demand because they reinvented and reconnected with all these uh, stay home people and they all needed food. So they came up with a new way of packaging a new way of creating food and also the delivery model. So there is the opportunity, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, learning, you talk about learning, uh, you know, it, w- w- I mean, I think there hasn't been a better time to learn because we had actually had a lot of extra time, but we also learned from experiential uh, uh, impact meaning the way we shop, meaning we, uh, you know, looking at streaming services that allows us to learn uh, from uh, docu-series, you know, all sorts of things, right? So, so that's why, and reinventing ourselves. Like, for example, if it wasn't pandemic and if, it was, if I wasn't uh, doing a lot of the work at home, I don't think I could actually sit there and pull together a book within, you know, nine months. Previous books took like two years or so. So, 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 I mean, these are, that's why it's optimistic. So now you say, okay, well, how do you change? I mean, you almost have, I, I, I go out of the way, I mean, you know me very, very, but 
by now that I, I kind of start with, you know, um, you as a human being and how do you get in touch with yourself and then how you connect yourself with the, with the outside world. So that connection uh, comes from empathy, right? You have to be very empathetic and practice empathy on a, on a conscious level that, that shows you what is going on around the world and what is going on within your, within your uh, realm, right? And, and that allows you to understand how do you, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, get opportunistic about change. So when you understand somebody, um, you know, a, a going through a pain point, and I'll, I'll put it in a commercial term, the restaurants that succeeded, but I'm just using that as a, as an, as a simple, understandable example. They were empathetic to the fact that it's an opportunity, but they were also very empathetic that, hey, I'm going to deliver the food, but then they will have to warm it up. And who warms it up, blah, blah, blah. So that's really putting yourself in somebody else's shoe, how they're going to live and work and eat and all that stuff. So that empathy is the fundamental pillar of transformational leadership, right? So because when, once you have empathy, then you can say, okay, how do I prepare myself to interact with other by being an influencer, by being a, a supporter, and by being a, 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 a enabler so that other people can succeed. As a result, I succeed, right? So, so that empathetic, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, practice, conscious practice on a daily basis, which is very difficult, by the way, because we're all, you know, I mean, you know, it's a, human beings are 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 these was designed to self preservation. So we we instantly first think about what's going on with me. But once you practice that, you know, you actually succeed and you're actually able to contribute a lot faster. So, so um, you know, and, and that, that, that eye on the other uh, allows you to do much more than you think you can do just focusing on yourself because it gives you a different kind of a purpose. You know, going back to the book, I think I, one of the reasons I was able to do it and despite my no planning or my any kind of goals of, you know, be, you know, that this has to do well commercially, because as you know, I don't, you know, I'm not the traditional author speaker that makes a living, unfortunately, you know, I've got other things. Uh, and I mean, uh, but it, it happened because of, I think, because of my personal circumstances and I looking at me, looking at the fact that I wanted to do something where I can generate revenue for, for giving to somebody else. I think that played a big role, how fast I was able to do it and, and whatever tra little traction that I'm having. With uh -huh. the so I, I think I totally agree. I think empathy is one of our most important things to learn. Do you, do you have a suggestion of how someone can be more empathic? Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a like for example, um, you know, you, you know, it's by the way, it's a conscious practice, just like mindfulness is, and there's a deep connection between mindfulness and empathy. I mean, every time you 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 have an interaction with somebody, right? I mean, let's say you you're you know, I mean, it's and we all get agitated, we lose patience and whatnot, it, it, you know, and let's say some, you know, you're, or, I mean, you know, and we've all gone through it. Like, you know, you're trying to have a work conversation and you're seeing that person is not engaged. There's some stuff going on in their lives, right? And, and then, you know, I mean, so it's easy to, easy to get frustrated with that person. I said, what's the matter with you? I mean, why haven't you done this? Blah, blah, blah. Excuse me. But it's, all, it's, it's a conscious practice saying, you know, to stop yourself and look at that other person and try to understand what is going on with that person? That is a practice of empathy, right? And you can make it bigger and bigger, and then you look at it as an ecosystem. You know, you, you, so, so that restaurant, an example, that was a collective, you know, the collective um, social pattern or ecosystem that was suffering from the common problem, right? So, so but it starts with one-on-one, -on -one, right? So, so um, you know, it's a, it, you really have to, like, look at, somebody else before you look at yourself. You know, I mean, that's where it kind of starts. I wanna, I wanna back, that's great, makes a lot of sense. And 
I'm thinking I was I was coaching another coach on how to ask questions the other day, and this he was having trouble understanding why this person was having a problem. And when you're saying this, I'm going, oh wow, he wasn't he wasn't putting himself in their shoes. He was busy trying to figure out what's the right question so he looks like a good coach. Yeah. Um, but I want to back you up to mindfulness. Um, what's the difference between mindfulness and meditating? And I have just, I just said to somebody the other day, you know, these people, I know these people, they meditate all the time. They are so negative. They just they open their mouth and they've got some negative thing to say. What's the difference between meditating? Oh, I'm a meditator and being mindful. So, uh, if, if, you know, by the way, you mentioned that, uh, that, that we are, we're, we're releasing everything connects. Fast Company is releasing, fa- you know, everything connects. It's actually the ebook version just came out and the hardcover will come out shortly. Uh-huh. Uh, same with the audio book. And I, we, uh, it's a second edition. So we expanded the original version and there's a new section, uh, you know, and one of the chapter in the ne- next, you know, in that section is, expansion of mindfulness uh, oh, so great. so so the the and you know it goes into meditation versus mindfulness i mean you know the real definition of mindfulness is being one with whatever you're doing so uh so if you actually look at history of mind you know the meditation it comes from a lot of eastern philosophy and the you know zen buddhist and and whatnot and if you study them one of the things they do is cleaning and cooking, right? And and that is a form of meditation because the idea is that when you're cooking, you're cooking. When you're sweeping, you're sweeping. There's no other thought should come in your head. So, so uh, and that is also, by the way, a conscious practice. So right now, when you and I are talking, in my mind, at least I try, it's not always easy, just like meditation. Mm-hmm. All I want to think about is this conversation. Nothing else matters. The fact that there's a thunderstorm, literally a thunderstorm <laughs> happening outside of my window, or, or let's say what I have to do later in the day, those, con- those thoughts should not come in my mind. And I have to be one with this conversation. That's what mindfulness is really about. It's giving uh, utmost importance uh, to that particular moment is what mindfulness is. Uh-huh. You cannot practice uh, empathy conscious empathy if you are not mindful of the person that is in front of you right so 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 um, you know so shutting your mind from all other thing aside from present is what mindfulness is about so that's that's beautiful uh, I remember talking to this woman was super angry at her boss and she had to go have a conversation with him and she's saying well what can I talk about? I'm so angry. And I said, well, what if you're just intensely curious about him and the conversation, which is another way of saying yes. or be present. Yeah. 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 And look, I mean, the runners or joggers will tell you that they, when they jog, they forget about everything else. The musicians will tell you that when they play music, you forget about everything. They forget about everything else. Or when you're listening to music, you forget about something you know, that you forget about everything else. Or when you read, you forget about everything and you're just focusing on the book. Those are all examples of being mindful, right? And those are all also examples of uh, meditation. So for example, I I love to cook. So that's my form of uh, meditation and mindfulness, even though I do meditate, uh, you know, uh, whenever I can, uh, early in the morning, you know, literally sitting outside, uh, you know, but, but but it's not about meditation. It's about, you know, being consciously present at the moment. And, and you can't possibly be empathetic if you're not present at the moment. Mm-hmm. And it really extends one's life. For and sure. um, there's no way to be a transformational leader unless you're mindful and you have empathy. For sure. I mean, how do you connect with people if you're not mindful and <laughs> empathetic? I mean, you know, uh, I mean, you know, so, so, so. I mean, there's more to our, more to transformational aside from being mindful and, and empathetic, but those are the first ingredient that allows you, you're in touch 
but how do you be in touch? Well, if you're not in touch, you can't, you know, you can't change anything, right? So you have to be right. It's like building blocks. There's no yes. way to get to the other building blocks until you right. do that. And I want to hear more about the transformational leader, but I wonder if you could, um, you said there was five questions that you can ask for empathy. Do you, this, this is a test. Can you remember what they are? <laughs> I don't actually remember what I wrote um, because, you know, by the way, that that piece of five question, um, it, it I wrote that many years ago, uh, okay. not about the book. I several, I think, four or five years ago, I wrote an article because I was struggling with the same thing where I would look at some of my managers and they would not just connect with with the people they're trying to lead and manage, and it came from there, right? So, so I wrote that, but you know, essentially. The questions are related to it is why and what and and how, right? So it's it's like you're really asking why are you doing what you're doing. So you have to actually first ask that yourself. So for example, if I'm asking somebody, hey, listen, we're going to do a reorg, as an example, right? So first you have to explain to yourself why do you want to reorg? Is it because efficiency is something broken? Is, is, is something not working, whatever it is. And then once you have those answers, then you say, okay, well, I, I need to restructure these people this way because of this reasoning, but also they have this particular expertise or they have this and that. And, and by the way, the world has changed, you know, all that other stuff. So you got to start with what is the reasoning? You know, what, what do you want to do something? You know, what's your purpose, right? So that's first. Second is, okay, so you got the why, and then you're saying, okay, so what will be the impact? If you did this, what, what is the outcome that you want to achieve from that? Is it, is it that you're trying to, um, you know, change the world? Is it that you're trying to grow revenue? Is it because that you want your employees to be happy? You want to make money for, more, more for your investor? Whatever it is, what would be the impact of that? Why? And then you have to figure, then you have to say, okay, how do you do that? How do you do that, right? So many, how do you make the why to what? What is the methods to making it happen, right? So you need the mechanism. So, so you know, so when you're intently, uh, you know, uh, trying to be transformational, uh, you, your empathy comes from that why, but then rest of it, it goes from, uh, you know, what the other two things I talked about in the book is the, the systemic thinking and systemic execution which is the how, and then, you know, the, the uh, experiential learning, uh, which is really about, about uh, how do we learn on a constant basis because adaptation doesn't come without learning, right? So uh, we know we have to change because we were forced to learn that world has changed, right? So, so that, that is experiential learning. You could read about, you know, 20 books. It's not going to resonate till you feel that, that, that experience, right? So, so um, I, you and I can talk about leadership all day long, but if we don't practice it in our own life, then we're just talking about it, right? So, so uh, you have to learn from doing it and, and whatnot. And systemic thinking, by the way, if you want to scale anything, for example, mm-hmm. you can't do that without, uh, without having a, a system in place. So for what I mean by that, uh, let's say you want to write a book, as an example, right? You you kind of have to, uh, you kind of have to, um, you know, um, figure out. Uh, you have to have a system in place how you're going to gather your information and how you're going to form uh, formulate that in, in a in an understandable manner. Then you have to figure out, you know, when do you how you're going to float it into chapter. So that's just writing process. Then you have to figure out, okay. How do I get it out to the world? You know, how, how does that become a repeatable process? How does people find me? How, you know, how does people, once they find you, what do they do with it, right? So these are all like systemic thinking that has to happen if you really want to have any kind of change in place that are repeatable, right? One-time change is not transformational change because transformation is about a journey. It's not like you go from one point A to point B and you're done because just when you say you're done, something else will happen, right? So, so you have to have a system in place that allows you to do that constant, um, you know, constant repeatable process of changing. 
You also mentioned design thinking. Tell me how yeah. that fits in. Yeah, so design thinking is, is, is I, I, I actually, even though I didn't use the word design, we just went through that process. It's the same general, thing. Same thing in the sense that, okay, well, uh, I, I want to write a book. Okay, who is it for? How are they going to use it? What are they going to learn from it? How am I going to portray my content? Yeah. So those are like the abstract design. Physical design would be, okay, what, is the, what does it look like? Is it friendly enough? Uh, can people access it, right? So those are all part and parcel of design thinking. By the way, one of the very big principles of, of design thinking is empathy because you cannot think from that point of view uh, unless you think about your audience is being empathetic to the audience in order to design something that has value, right? So, so the design thinking comes from, uh, you know, a very basic principle of design thinking is actually empathy, but is designing for somebody else, not for yourself, and then making it accessible so that it becomes a, a, of something of a value. Book, audio, tape, uh, a course, you know, a software, which is my primary business, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's all the same. What I'm, what I'm finding with a lot of leaders is there, there are not really good uh, courses or training programs. Certainly, you, you could go to the Center for Creative Leadership or Harvard or Yale or Cornell and take a course. But for the majority of people, they don't really have access to really good mentors and teachers, which is one of the reasons I have this program, because I want people to learn. Um, they could take your book and use that as a way to learn. And also, you said there's a course. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, so I, I developed this five-part course. Uh, it's, a doc, it's, it's designed as a documentary-style, docu-series type of a course. Uh, and there is obviously exercises and reference material, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I, you know, I, I apply design thinking in that because, you know, one of the things you meant, you know, uh, the reason there are not too many good courses or you don't get value out of it is because, you know, you have to make the learning process experiential, right? I mean, the, the many ways, the way the courses has been uh, delivered now is still very old style. Um, can you, um, you know, in the sense that it's very academic, it's you take it so that you can pass a course, you know, uh, a, you take a test and you pass a course, mm -hmm. you get a certificate, et cetera, et cetera. Those days are over, right? So, I mean, you, you have to learn, you want to learn because you want to learn, not because you have to, you want to get a certificate or a grade or whatever, right? So, mm -hmm. so I mean, you know, I mean, if you look at the new generation, you know, I look at my son's uh, generation, they're learning more from YouTube videos and they're learning from, uh, you know, uh, playing something or, or going and, and, and picking up some, you know, some devices or they're going at a, um, a restaurant, you know, like most of us think about mo people who are, uh, you know, a little older, they had a, they had a very hard time just scanning the QRP code to pull up the menu, right? And I compare that to my, you know, the younger generation, the 19 years old had no problem with it. But that's the experiential learning. But guess what? We too got used to, oh, or you, you take your phone and you scan the QRP code and that's how you get the menu, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a behavioral change. So the, the leadership training and the courses or the practices also has to be very experiential. We, people love to hear stories. You don't remember the method, but you remember the stories. So one of the things I tried to do, and it was a kind of an experiment, uh, because you know I'm a product developer, I like to do experimentation. If you look at those courses that I just talked about are on Lyft, it is like a mo watching movie. And it's like, it, it talks about, you know, this is how the world has changed, here's a tsunami. So there's a narrator and there's videos and real footage and whatnot. Uh, and, and it's not like, okay, somebody saying, okay, you, Go through these five slides, and then you you test your uh, you know your your skill by taking this short test, and then you go to the next one. No, I mean those days are over. <laughs> you don't learn from that. You remember movies, right? So, I mean, and you remember experiences. You remember stories. 
So the storytelling and experiential uh, learning process and, 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 and the emotion that gets evoked from seeing something and listening something and talking to other people are the next generation learning process. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to be a uh, you know, mentor or, or a coach or whatever, which I'm not, you know, they, 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 have to, uh, they have to teach from their own experience. They can't just, uh, or, or produce material uh, that are from, from uh, actual doing it and, and connecting with them by, by, you know, those kind of a, a real, uh, real scenario, right? So, so um, you know, I mean, I don't write anything from, I and mean, I do a lot of research because I want to back up my, my, you know, my, whatever I'm saying, but most of my stuff comes from me being in the field and doing and sometimes succeeding and many times failing and then try to try to get, make it better uh, point of view and being very observant of what other people does or doesn't do. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I agree with what you're saying. And I think also, um, as you're reading or watching the videos that you've done or reading your book, it's also noticing what level, mindfully noticing what level you're at yes. in your leadership and then being empathic. Uh, okay, I made a mistake. What do I need to do to correct that or get rid of that behavior? Or that's great. And now what do I want to do next? In a way, we have to, we have to become our own coach and guide through a lot of this in order to really move to the top levels. Yeah, I mean, like, look, there's nothing, there's no substitute for doing. You have to do what you're preaching, right? I mean, so, so you can't, you can't, you know, it's like, uh, listen, we have to work hard, but I'm punching out at three o'clock. Uh, that, that's not a very good reflection of leader. Or, or we have to cut costs, but I'm happy to take a private jet. That, that's not a very good reflection of leadership, right? So often our leaders uh, of all level, you know, uh, and I've kind of seen all gamuts by now, uh, mm -hmm. they do, they say one thing, do completely differently, different things. That's not a good motiv motivator, right? So if you want to be influencer, I mean, the command control is over. I mean, you know, people have a lot more opportunities now. I mean, you, you, you I'm sure you have, Heard this great, uh, you know, um, dissatisfaction and not wanting to work at all, and and a resignation and whatnot. The great resignation, a lot of conversation about great resignation, but we're headed towards recession, so that may change. But people in general have a lot more options. So you really, as a leader, your job is as a we talk about transformational leader and influential leader. It, you really have to be an influencer and an inspirational in chief versus uh, the command control. And you have to practice what you preach. You, you have to be, you have to walk the talk. You cannot not do that and be, be transformational of any kind. I, I totally agree. I'm going to back up in your, in your book. You were, you say we should all be futurists. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I admired in your book was the great ways you put together lots of different information and came up with some different ways of thinking about things that I had never thought of. Um, it took me some. Sometimes I sat there for an hour just pondering some idea you'd put forth and trying to decide how that where that fit into my reality. So it was, it was, for me, it was fun. But how do I become a futurist? Well, I mean, you know, so, so I give you uh, my own example and, and then, then, you know, because for each is, is different because we're all, uh, which each one of us are just like our unique DNAs. We have unique journeys, right? You can't replicate somebody else's journey, but you can, uh, adopt the philosophy and you can adopt uh, the, the techniques, you know, I mean, I mean, as a cook, I say this all the time, it's, you know, it's a, it's a philosophy, it's not the recipe, it's the technique, it's not, not, not knowing you put two spoons of that and three spoons of this, right? So, right. so I look at life from that point of view. And, and, and so 
uh, I mean, you, you were just talking about developing that coursework, and and I, you know, I mean, people will tell, uh, you know, people will judge whether I've been successful creating uh, an innovative way of delivering content or not. But the way I looked at it, I looked at it, uh, who's my future? Well, my children are my future. So how are they learning, right? So, so when, you know, so those are the questions. So I said, okay, well, if I wanted to teach whatever I'm learning to my son, if I give that book, he's not going to read more than three pages. I know that for a fact. Mm -hmm. But if I create a, a docu-style engaging uh, uh, video-driven uh, learning uh, uh, vehicle, he will do that because I see him doing that all day long, right? So, so, so there is my futurist in me looking at, at that generation and say, okay, well, if that is the generation I'm trying to attract, that, that, that I have to change the way I'm thinking of how am I producing content as an example, right? So, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a that kind of a thing, but you know, um, in order to be a futurist, you you also have to develop basic techniques that you cannot substitute, which are very fundamental. Like for example, the you know, I mean, it's a, uh, you know, I mean, it's like a, whether you're um, you know whether you're a writer, a musician, um, chef. Uh, concert pianist, everybody will tell you is the ritualistic practice that gives you the techniques and then you can improvise. If you don't have those techniques, you can't improvise. Being futurist is about looking at what's going on on the planet and then improvising your skill set for that changed world. But if you don't have that basic skills, your core competency, how are you going to do that? But I, I'm not, I was able to deliver my content uh, because not because I'm a content delivery expert, because I know my domain, but I'm just using a different medium to deliver that content in a different way. And I tapped into other people who are expert in, in uh, packaging content, uh, not necessarily in the similar domain and not necessarily in similar field, but so I, you know, this this call, you know, asking for help and collaborating with people where you don't have the skill also allows you to bring you those different perspectives, right? So there's a combination of, um, you know, uh, you know, and I, I mean, you, if you remember, we talked about last time, being, uh, uh, you know, uh, being being uh, consciously omnivorous, right? So meaning you you have to eat a lot of food if you wanted to develop your own set of uh, dishes or you know and and what that means is that if you haven't tasted different flavor how can you create your own flavor right yeah. so so being futurist means you know to be a futurist you have to experience a whole lot of things you know i know you know going back to da vinci um i wrote that article right after everything connects because i, I you know i was i was thinking about you know because we used da vinci as a as a in the backdrop and you know that his ability to connect the nature and how Bart flies and therefore we should come up with a flying machine that has wings like the Bart flies and I'm going to study the pattern of the of the of the flight of a Bart. Those are very dis you know very different things and then connecting those dots to create something different. Well, if you want to have vision of the future, you kind of have to study all the things that are going around you and ask those questions and then you can create the future and be a futurist. Wow. I have never in my whole life heard anybody explain that. And it makes so much sense. <laughs> Thank uh, you. And, and I actually have kind of a little tiny example of that. I have, I used to want to take classes in flower arranging and, Oh, if I could just arrange flowers. Well, I live on an acre, an acre of land. I have right now there's 40 dahlia bushes that are blooming, loads of roses. I have literally thousands of flowers. And the reality is, is if you go out every day and you pick flowers and you put them in a vase, at some point you get pretty damn good at it. Yeah, so it, <laughs> sure, it's ritualistic practice. Yeah, just yeah. the practice. All of a sudden it's like, whoa, that looks pretty good, you know, but it's just doing it over and over again. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I'm sure sure you know Jack Papan. I mean, he says it all the, all the time. Just cook. Don't look at the recipe book. Just cook. Just keep cooking, and you'll find your own rhythm. You know, I mean, it, it's a uh, you know, or or you know, Chef Mario says the same thing. So just yeah. cook. You know, because it's it's a uh, you know that's you know, and then you know, I mean, uh, uh, if you remember uh, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, he, he used to say all the time that writing is one of his biggest challenge. And the only way he can do it is because he would sit every day, three, four hours, and just write. It doesn't matter what comes out of his mind. He would just exactly. write, right? So that is the ritualistic practice. Right. And so many people want to skip that part. You can't <laughs> good at it if you don't practice. You can't do it. You know, I, I was just talking to a man who's a... He's a head of a company and he wants to be a coach. And he's telling me, oh, I had this problem in my coaching. Well, I was coaching, so I had a problem. I said, that's because you're not very skilled at it. And he's, he's so confident he could hear that without feeling bad about himself. You know, it's, it takes practice. you got to keep doing it. Oh, this has been so wonderful. Is there, we're just about done. Is there any um, – can you – Give the people listening, especially the women, some action they can go take that will help help us to change the world and make it a better place. <laughs> That's mine. Look, I mean, I, I will. Uh, I'll give. Um, uh, this is not a woman or man thing. Uh, okay. One of the, I'll, I'll try to give two. Uh, first thing is that philosophically know that. Uh, you know, uh, life is not fair, and we always have challenges. And it's, um, um, you know, uh, you just have to go through the journey and, and be optimistic. And uh, not all will work out exactly the way you thought, but it can be very interesting, you know, and that is the thrill of it, right? So you have to be able to think that way and, and plow through it. And so, so, and why that matters is because you can't lift anyone if you don't know how to lift yourself, right? So one of the key messages of the entire book is that lift yourself to lift others, right? So that's, so if you're a man and woman, young, old, you know, live here, live there, it doesn't matter, that applies anywhere, right? So that's one point. Second point is that this, 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 uh, this notion of a transformational, you know, I mean, you don't have to change the world to be transformational. You know, you, you can do like one little thing and you can be transformational, right? So for example, um, you know, um, we have all these organizations, you know, this is one of my other favorite charity as I from recent, uh, not recent, I've always been into the, the cancer research, but it just hit home now more than ever. But, you know, another one is, is food related. And you see that uh, Chef Jose Andres is uh, World Kitchen. And look at like UN cannot do it. Government cannot do it. He has managed to do this, right? So that's a great uh, study of leadership because the way he has done it is that it's very fundamental empathical need that everybody's hungry, we have to feed them, that's number one. But we have to put a system where no matter where, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, any kind of crisis happens, I got to be able to mobilize the local people so that they can go and help the people, local people, local crisis, local help, right? And, and, and I have to be able to learn repeatedly and improve upon that process. That's one of my other charity, right? So if you look at that, that is a great example of what I just talked about in terms of empathetic, uh, you know, a leadership combined with systemic execution and experiential learning, plowing back to the whole system so that you can improve it and make monumental impact. But each of those people that are serving locally, they have, be, they are transforming that particular moment and time, and that is enough, right? So you don't have to go and change the world 
the goal of transformational leadership doesn't have to be changing the world, just changing yourself and your surroundings. And then if we all did that, then the world would be a better place. Oh, that's beautiful. What a wonderful place to end. Thank you so much for coming on the show and talking to us today. My pleasure. It's my honor. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome.